So this is our, our last module, module eight. Um, and um, what I'm, it's sort of a, a wrap up. Uh, we'll talk about a few other tools and techniques that uh, might be of interest, but I'll also be talking about a lot of applications. Um, and the idea is to try and leave you with a, uh, I guess, some, a sense of excitement, uh, perhaps, of what's possible in the field of metabolomics. Um, obviously, I'm sort of preaching to the choir. A lot of you are quite uh, engaged in metabolomics already. Um, so, uh, this progression that I talked about, where we go from spectra to lists and lists to, to, to data, um, uh, clusters, and then from clusters to pathways, and then eventually to um, I guess ultimately integrating that into understanding genes and proteins and, and more of systems biology. Um, so that progression is one of the things we're going to um, talk about a little bit more. We're going to also address some of the applications of metabolomics to, to clinical medicine. Obviously there are many applications outside of, of, of medicine, but um, typically for a, a field to sort of get a, a more than a toehold in the world. Um, people like to be able to show that there's some applications um, to, to health. And, and metabolomics has struggled, as has proteomics. Um, uh, on the other hand, genomics um, has had fairly smooth sailing and has received quite a bit of support. Um, talk about biomarkers and a concept called receiver operating characteristic curves or rock curves. This is an important area that um, people are starting to appreciate more, but it, it's, it's still largely unknown. Um, learn a little bit about metabolomics and applications in the pharma industry, and then some new trends in metabolomics. So the last session there, we, we learned a little bit about how we were able to go from lists to pathways and identify important pathways and learn a little bit about topology, but we also learned about the statistics that allow us to identify groups of metabolites that are significant. And that's important. You have to be able to identify uh, those compounds that are significantly altered before you really can think about pathways and metabolism. We've talked about pathway databases before, and, and actually you've seen the links to both KEG and SMITDB. We've talked a little bit more about the SMIT database, um, and I won't reiterate it, just that um, there's a lot of information that you can do with it. Uh, and it's similar now to uh, the psych databases, where that's the capacity to do concentration mapping. And, and it's a way pathways really allow you to integrate uh, metabolism with proteomics, genomics, um, and, and the concept of systems biology. So from pathways and lists, um, there's obviously some hope, and this is the central focus, I think, of a lot of systems biology, to actually modeling systems modeling metabolism, predicting um, things like the dynamics, um, kinetics of, of, of metabolism, uh, predicting flux and flux balance. Um, Bernie Paulson, who's at, uh, in San Diego, is, is quite well known um, for developing uh, reconstructions, metabolic reconstructions. And in fact, they've done a, a metabolic reconstruction very recently of, of uh, human metabolism. They did one on human metabolism called Recon 1, they're now on Recon 2. Um, and uh, I think the number of compartments is now up to 15, the number of compounds is almost doubled, I think. Um, but this is a systems biology map of human metabolism, where all the reactions are mass balanced and charge balanced, compartments carefully identified, all the proteins and enzymes are uh, identified. The transcripts and genes are also mapped. Um, and it was a, a major effort, both for Recon 1 and then the recent one, which was published a few months ago, Recon 2, was about, I think, 30 different authors. Paulson is famous in particular for um, using um, these metabolic reconstructions of both humans and a number of single cell systems for doing flux balance analysis of FBA. Um, and 
he has invented a term called bibliomic or bibliomics, uh, where they do literature surveys and searches uh, to start from the gene lists to build the protein lists to build the reaction lists and the metabolite lists and to do uh, validation and iterative debugging. Uh, but this process actually has allowed them to identify gaps in metabolic pathways and um, well, has also allowed them to uh, model metabolism. Um, they don't need uh, you know, specific uh, reaction kinetics or binding constants. Um, what flux balance analysis does is sort of allow you to figure out what the inputs are, what the outputs are, and whether everything is balanced, and what happens when you perturb the balance. Um, so it's sort of like, if you could imagine a traffic uh, flow on um, 401 or other busy roads and the feeder highways into it, and then if someone has an accident, what's the consequence? Uh, or there's a flood, what's the consequence? Um, and that's what sort of flux balance can do because there's a flux of, of traffic, a flux of cars, and they enter and leave. Um, and there are various pathways that are followed. Um, flux balance analysis is widely used. Another thing that you can do is, is actually more kinetic modeling. Um, some years ago, we worked on a thing called SimCell. Um, if anyone's sort of heard of SimCity, uh, sort of the simulations that you do, or building a city and um, um, taxing people and then building amusement parks and everything else. I don't know, has anyone heard of SimCity? Just one with a thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but these, this is a very popular game, in fact it's picked up again, I think, because they keep on improving it. Um, but what it does is it, it's based on a thing, a concept called cellular automata. So you're not actually solving differential equations, or partial differential equations, or stochastic differential equations. You're just actually letting the computer sort of flip coins or roll dice and perform actions and you're letting it happen sort of simultaneously. And th these are called agent-based model systems. And <coughs> some agent-based modeling is used in some of these uh, virtual worlds, if anyone's ever tried those. Um, and you can apply it to modeling uh, cells. And, and you can model a lot. You can model uh, metabolism, you can model cell signaling and interactions and drug interactions. And for this particular tool, we built an interface that allows you to draw out cells and draw out sort of simple pathways. This is one, I think, for the tryptophan, operon, and E. coli. Uh, you can set some numbers, choose values that are in the literature, choose random numbers. You can identify genes, enzymes, transporters, metabolites, um, literally draw pathways. And in fact, the intent was to tie this to SBML, Assistance Biology Markup Language, tie it to the SMIPDB, uh, so you can actually do uh, real modeling. Uh, turned out to be a lot harder than we planned, but um, this is sort of, as I say, the vision of where you can take um, a SMIPDB diagram, translate that to a SimCell diagram through what's called the Assistance Biology Markup Language, um, and now compartments are modeled and um, flux, and kinetics, and dynamics, and conversion can be modeled using essentially stochastic uh, cellular automata. Um, we're in the process of just converting all the SMIP dbs to SBML images, which then would allow us to use the sim cell, but it's, as I say, taken a long time. So through modeling, it, it is possible, and people are starting to do this more and more. It gives us you know, almost mathematical insight into uh, metabolism. It's fundamentally what systems biology is supposed to be about, which is to be able to predict and model um, events at an atomic scale. Uh, it's pretty cool, although no one's really found any practical applications for it yet. Uh, on the other hand, there are lots of practical applications for metabolomics, and this is a list that we saw way back uh, yesterday, just some of the applications that people are using with metabolomics. Um, and, and, you know, if you were to measure it in terms of millions of dollars or thousands of jobs employed, it's, it's quite significant. It's just most people don't attach the word metabolomics to it. So I'll 
just discuss some of the applications to clinical uh, medicine. In part, that's because of questions. Um, I was a person I used mental illness. Well, they were mental illness. But I don't know, for example, if there is a Yeah, it, it is, although they are probably called flavor chemists uh, or something else, anything but metabolomics. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think anyone should feel offended if they don't want to use the term. I mean, most of us can't even pronounce the word metabolomics. But um, the concept being is that, yeah, you're using analytical chemistry to look at, at a bunch of different things uh, simultaneously and uh, uh, trying to interpret it uh, in a biological context. So, um, applications to clinical medicine. Um, one application originally, and in fact, metabolomics has got its start, really, uh, in the characterization of inborn errors of metabolism. So they're called IEMs. And you guys, I think, did a little exercise uh, last night uh, where you probably picked up on the uh, aspect of um, phenylketonuria um, being evident in a particular sample. But it's, it's a case where you can use um, databases like uh, HMDB, where it's either lists of, of masses or lists of, uh, of analytes or metabolites that can allow you to identify um, compounds that are substantially uh, upregulated or downregulated, um, and then associate those with um, metabolic disorders. Um, you could put in the LCMS peak lists, and again, the same sort of thing is, is possible. Um, the uh, function on browsing diseases, uh, when I made the update last a few weeks ago to 3.5, took, unfortunately, this browsing diseases search off, but I've asked them to put that back on. But it's an example where if you put down a local list of metabolites, it will give you um, the likely lists based on the number of hits. Um, so that's an example of how you can use a sort of a database and just simply matching. It's, it's kind of a trivial example, but um, this is um, something that um, does inform people and has been used to inform in the past. Given there's 600 diseases that we know about that have significant metabolic perturbations, no one's going to memorize them. And given that many inborn errors of metabolism uh, involve changes uh, to met metabolite levels that none of us can even pronounce. Um, it is helpful to have these kinds of references um, online and readily searchable. So that's one example. Another interesting example was something I became aware of a, a few years ago, and um, this is the relationship to um, should be type two, it should be type one diabetes progression, um, but. Um, Type 1 diabetes is sometimes called juvenile diabetes, and um, it's been a real puzzle. In fact, it's largely thought to be a, almost a purely genetic disorder. But there's um, unusually high levels of type 1 diabetes in Finland, um, and they have a lot of concern over that. It's, you know, what is it? Whether they're eating something, or there's exposure, or whether it's just unusual genetics there. And this particular uh, one was, um, um, uh, looking at uh, young patients who had sort of a, uh, the parents had a family history or siblings family history of type 1 diabetes. And what they found with this particularly long-term study where they're doing some broad analyses was that um, children who develop diabetes, type 1 diabetes, are almost born with unusually high levels of glutamic acid in their blood, which, you know, so what? Uh, it's something that we can use and mobilize. Um, but then what happens is that uh, as the glutamic acid levels start to normalize, uh, they also see another large increase in GABA uh, shortly after, as they get, as this person is getting older. Um, and then um, what is typically characterized by um, uh, type 1 diabetes are what are called autoantibodies to an enzyme called GAD, um, and it's glutamate something something decarboxylase, um, which um, is 
um, an enzyme which is exclusively produced in the pancreas. And um, evidently, it seems that this particular enzyme um, it has to be pumped up um, in order to start dealing with these very high levels of, of glutamate and GABA. And uh, the body doesn't like seeing these high levels of this protein, and it thinks the protein is foreign, so it creates antibodies to it. Um, so the antibodies then attack this enzyme, but in the process they attack the pancreas and eventually destroy the pancreas. So is this balance of, of the body essentially trying to mitigate very high levels of glutamate, which is it's responding by producing high levels of an enzyme, which then the body responds to by producing antibodies to get rid of the enzyme, inadvertently leads to diabetes. So the cause of type 1 diabetes may in fact be a metabolic imbalance uh, very early on uh, with very high levels of glutamate. And this is quite striking because it, 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 most people are instead are looking at the antibodies um, or are looking at the pancreatic dysfunction. Now there are multiple causes to type 1 diabetes and this is not um, the only uh, example of this and there are other examples where the pancreas can be destroyed for very, from various toxins um, and other conditions. But it is fascinating to think that in fact there is a, a metabolic control mechanism that the body is trying to do by mitigating activities of enzymes through antibodies, ultimately leading to a disease. Um, HMDB, um, as you guys have perhaps seen, and although I'll emphasize again, there's a lot of information in the database that links diseases with um, metabolites, and even some of this stuff about glutamate probably has made it into the database. Um, and um, you can use that and could or should use it as a resource to, to learn a little bit more about um, the disease associations with, with metabolites. Um, metabolomics can also be used uh, in applications for bacterial identification. And this obviously could be used in environmental metabolomics, but it's being used in the clinic. Um, and it's essentially trying to identify or more rapidly identify bacteria based on their chemical footprint. So we've got rapid methods for sequencing uh, bacteria, uh, but you still have to grow enough of them and, and often culture, and that takes a little while. Um, but if you could look at someone had a urinary tract infection and wanted to know what kind of bacteria is causing it or uh, whether it's a, um, a pathogen of one type or another, um, you can look for very specific metabolites that are produced by very specific strains of, of bacteria. And this was actually implemented a few years ago where they used actually NMR. Um, so yes, the usual route is 24 to 48 hours culture, but with NMR you could just simply take a urine sample, look to see if there are any metabolic byproducts in the urine, um, and then um, you can actually, uh, if there are bacteria in the urine, you can start adding substrates. And because there are a few bacteria, they can actually do some pretty quick metabolic conversions. And so there are four substrates they have that allowed them to look to see whether they had E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, or this uh, Mirabellus bacterium, each of them with unique bacterial uh, metabolic pathways, and each of them with substrates that allow you to identify. So not only can you identify whether there's a urinary tract infection, you can identify the cause, um, and you can do it fairly quickly. And given how insensitive NMR is, you can imagine it could be much, much faster if you use mass spec. So those are some sort of curiosity-driven ones, as I say, the diabetes example, uh, urinary tract infections, uh, bacterial detection. But there are other things, particularly more frequently, and certainly last week's conference, the Metabolomics Society, there's lots of discussions about biomarkers. And this is the application of metabolomics to the clinic. But it's also the applications of metabolomics to drug discovery and, and drug development. Different types of biomarkers, there's at least five. Uh, they're diagnostic biomarkers. Those are the ones that tell you whether you have a condition or a disease. In many cases, some people could just simply look at a person and say you've got the disease. But there are some diseases, an example being chronic fatigue syndrome, where it's really, really hard to diagnose. Uh, Parkinson's, another one that uh, the early stages takes up to two years to figure out whether you've got the disease or not. ALS is another one. 
lots of conditions where the diagnosis is not easy and makes and costs tens of thousands of dollars and takes months or years. Prognostic ones, typically case you have a disease, but how will you do with it? So some people have conditions and in fact they live most of their lives, long, healthy lives, with the condition. Others, for a particular disorder, um, can go very bad very quickly. And so prognosis is an important thing. So it's actually somewhat predictive, but it's essentially uh, saying how you will do with this condition. Predictive biomarkers are different. You are currently healthy. Can we predict whether you will develop a disease? So the classic predictive biomarkers are the BRCA1, BRCA2 genes. Um, they can tell a woman whether she might have a high propensity of developing breast or ovarian cancer. Um, although as much as the press is coming about the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, they are not very predictive. In the world of, of food and drugs um, and toxicologies, there are markers of response or toxicity. So how will you respond to this toxin or this drug? Some people are responders, some people are non-responders. Uh, some of you probably know this yourselves. You try some medication, it just does nothing for you, whereas another person, it knocks them out. Um, there are also markers of exposure, and these are becoming increasingly important, and it's a field called the exposome. Uh, so the metabolome, the genome, and the exposome. So the exposome is an indicator of what you're exposed to. So it could be um, polychlorinated biphenyls, it could be um, pollutions, it could be lead, it could be mercury. Uh, those are the bad ones. Also good exposures, um, you know, antioxidants and other things. But these represent, again, what you may have uh, taken and what may have consequences for uh, your life expectancy or general health. There are some interesting biomarker statistics, and this has a lot to do with how quantitative a given technique is. So gene sequencing is quantitative. Uh, it produces letters and positions, and it has uh, confidences in terms of the reads, the read lengths. And so a mutation is something that someone can quantitatively identify. They can say it is this mutation, A to T, at position 4,267. Um, and because it's uh, a quantitative, reproducible technique, no matter where you do it, the sequence will always be the same, no matter which instrument, country, city, clinic. So that makes uh, gene sequencing a very good biomarker uh, technique. The result is that there's more than 2,000 genetic tests that are used and approved in North America. However, um, they only cover very rare diseases or conditions. Um, because most diseases, believe it or not, are actually not genetic. Um, so, um, as extensive as the biomarker sets are for genomics and DNA sequencing, um, it only covers a relatively small portion of diseases. So everyone jumped onto the transcriptomics and RNA-seq bandwagon, um, more so in the transcriptomics and microarrays, thinking that, well, really, it's not the genes, it's going to be gene expression. The problem was you couldn't get quantitative measurements on microarrays. And so a number of companies struggled mightily over almost a decade to try and get at least some uh, microarray tests approved. Some of them are. There's one for, um, again, a breast cancer test called Mammaprint. Uh, there's one for colon cancer. But none of these have taken off, and I think many of the companies that started them have sort of bailed out. So at one point there were five. I don't know if there are any still going on anymore. Because again, the techniques proved to be very non-reproducible because they're not quantitative. Proteomics, um, there's 111 uh, approved protein tests in, in North America and Europe. Only one of them is based on proteomics. The reason why there's so few is because, again, uh, no proteomic assays are quantitative. And this is something that has really hurt the proteomics community for a long time. And so there's a substantial shift in, in labs, particularly in labs like Christoph Borcher's group, where they're leading with the idea of moving towards quantitative proteomics. Um, metabolomics, which is actually the youngest of all of these omics ones, um, actually is doing pretty good. Uh, if you look at the number of tests that are associated with uh, metabolite readouts, uh, there's quite a few. Uh, the most common, the 
glucose monitor. Uh, but there are other compounds that are read routinely every, every day, hundreds of thousands of times every day that are, are based on small molecules. And they're all in the realm of clinical chemistry or newborn screening. And, and they cover many of the common diseases, heart disease, um, cancer, um, uh, diabetes, um, obesity, uh, atherosclerosis, lung disease, all of these things. Um, are actually detectable through small molecules. Some examples, um, these are just again some sort of random examples, but this happened to be done at the University of Alberta. Um, you can actually use urine to determine if someone has pneumonia. Now, pneumonia actually is a very hard to diagnose condition. It's one where people mistake it for a cold, bronchitis, a bad cough, or just a bad day. There's also a distinction between viral pneumonia and bacterial pneumonia. And again, it's extremely difficult to diagnose. So this is an example of a disease that is hard to diagnose. And if you could actually just do a simple urine test, it would really change the field. And this is what they actually demonstrated, is that you can distinguish bacterial pneumonia from many other conditions that present with the same um, symptoms. And so the usual approach is to sort of take a, a lung or sputum exam sample and to grow up uh, over multiple days. And if it's pneumonia and you're waiting for two to three days for the bacteria to grow, uh, either the person will die uh, because you're waiting so long, or if it turns out to be a viral pneumonia, you will have been treating them the wrong way, which is also bad. But if you could do a urine test and, and figure out whether you have pneumonia and what type, viral or bacterial, that's an answer you could get in a few, few seconds to a few minutes. And what they found was they're very distinct metabolic profiles. People with TB who sort of present with pneumonia, people with real pneumonia, and then people who are healthy. And you can just see, in this case, just you don't have to be a genius in NMR, but to see that some very distinct differences uh, in aromatic features, but also some distinct differences um, in aliphatic regions, and then very distinct differences in the branch chain amino acids and certain um, organic acids that seem to distinguish quite strongly individuals from pneumonia. Now, this has nothing to do with uh, amino acid synthesis and, and breakdown. This probably has a lot to do with um, signaling. And in particular, branch chain amino acids play a significant role in um, uh, signaling uh, insulin secretion and uh, uh, controlling um, um, general stress responses. So um, still it has to be sorted out why, but it's remarkable that a urine test could actually tell you whether someone has something wrong with their lungs. Another example which is difficult to diagnose is organ rejection. The most common transplant is kidney transplants. There's thousands done uh, every year, thousands of lives saved. Um, organs can last a long time, but obviously they can be rejected. And if an organ is rejected and you can't find a replacement, uh, the person has to go on dialysis. In some cases they die. Um, the thing that most of you may not know is that even with organ transplants, even organ transplants that seem to be stable, you have to go in fairly routinely and have a big, long needle stuck into you to sample your kidney or your heart or your lung or whatever organ that's been transplanted. And then they do have, have to do a histology assay. So it hurts, it's painful, it's costly because it has to be analyzed by a pathologist. And the pathologist who usually looks at it gets it wrong about a third of the time. So it's not a very good assay, but it's still better than nothing. So they've tried, they've tried microarrays, they've tried gene tests, they've tried proteomic assays. Um, the question is, could you actually just do a blood or urine test that would work? Um, we looked at this actually, and we looked at uh, just urine samples from individuals who were uh, identified by pathology and uh, tissue samples to actually have a rejection issue. And uh, one of the things that struck us was at very, very high levels, and these are quantitative measures, and I'll emphasize both the ones I could be given, or both the NMR one for pneumonia and this one, we're using quantitative metabolomics, identified very high levels of carnitines um, in the urine. 
Um, and uh, these are the VIP weights and the VIP scales from a tab analyst, and it says there's something going wrong or something definitely in the carnitine synthesis that's, that's heavily modified. You can do your PLSDA and you can see very distinct uh, separation and very strong uh, sensitivity and specificity in terms of what this uh, assay is suggesting. Why carnitine? Well, it turns out carnitines are produced by white blood cells. And when they're active, metabolically active, they have uh, uh, very active beta oxidation pathways, and carnitines are critical to production of, of fatty acids and the breakdown of fatty acids. And in fact, carnitines generally are great markers for both inflammation and um, high white blood cell activity. Um, so again, it doesn't really have anything to do with, say, the biosynthesis. It has a lot to do with the fact that you're seeing a signal arising from a certain class of cells being metabolically active in a region that they're not supposed to be, namely the kidney. Um, and then what you see are these soluble components, carnitines coming out in the urine. One study that received a tremendous amount of attention at the uh, Metabolomics Society last week, but it's been around since 2010 or 11, is the relationship between metabolomics and cardiovascular disease, uh, particularly atherosclerosis. So this is the clogging of arteries. And when you get clots, that can what, lead to heart attacks and stroke, um, and also reduce efficiency in the heart, and uh, sometimes also neurodegenerative conditions. What was found by uh, Hazen's group in, in Cleveland was this fascinating relationship between the gut microflora, so this is published in Nature, and um, what you eat, particularly if you eat lots of fatty foods. Uh, fatty foods have phosphatidylcholine. You get them in eggs, you get them in butter, you get them in red meat and french fries. Um, and what happens uh, is that when you have fatty foods, the, f the choline is, is stripped off, the phosphatidylcholine, and it's converted um, to betaine. Uh, the betaine will kind of float around as well, uh, eventually ending up uh, being converted to trimethylamine by the bacteria, the gut microflora who will then convert it to trimethylamine anoxide, or it can also be converted through the liver. Certain types of bacteria are very good at converting uh, or converting stripping choline, producing betaine, and gener generating um, TMA, or trimethylamine. Turns out the toxic ch chemical here is trimethylamine oxide. And so if you inject TMAO into arteries, you can get atherosclerosis. That seems to be the trigger for it. It also explains an interesting phenomenon that some people can eat all the fatty foods they want and never develop atherosclerosis, or other people who just sort of walk by uh, a slab of butter instantly seem to get atherosclerosis. And that has a lot to do with their gut microflora, the bacteria that they have or that they were born with. Um, so this connection between what you eat, what's in your gut microflora, and ultimately what the chemicals that lead to uh, atherosclerosis. Um, it's a fascinating story, and they've published several more papers since this, proving quite solidly that this is the case. And when you think about the amount of money that's been spent looking at both the genetics and the proteomics and the diet issues associated with cardiovascular disease, this suggests perhaps a remarkably simple solution and a whole avenue for treatment because we've done very poorly at actually treating this disease, and this is where metabolomics uh, may help solve one of the, the great scourges of, um, of medicine and health. This just illustrates the process in a nice diagram that they had, um, where it's just taking the fatty foods from the foods we all like to eat, how um, choline is produced, particularly in the gut microflora, and then transformed into TMA, which then goes to the liver, which is converted to TMAO, um, which then causes atherosclerosis, heart attack, stroke, and other cardiovascular conditions. Another one that also has made a fair bit of headway, and 
uh, is relevant, and I've mentioned a couple times, discussed lots. Uh, and it's not just by the Gersten group in Harvard, but also by um, several, many other groups uh, in, in the US and North Carolina in particular. Um, and this is the observation that diabetes, which is a disease of sugar metabolism and the pancreas, and this is primarily type 2 diabetes, is a disease that can be predicted extremely well by the presence of five amino acids. Uh, the branched chain amino acids, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. And this study describes uh, the effort that they did to, to do this. They validated, or actually confirmed it first on the Framingham Heart Study, a very famous study where they've collected lots of data on people for many, many decades, but then validated on a Swedish cohort um, looking at blood samples. And they looked at people who were basically you know, healthy, potentially generally young, average weight, looked at their blood, and then looked at their health status 10 to 12 years later, and found that they were able to predict very, very accurately those who would develop diabetes and those who wouldn't. And all they had to do was look at uh, these branched chain amino acids. And if they were elevated uh, somewhat significantly, then it was pretty certain that those individuals would develop it. And as I say, looking at these individuals, you, there's no way you could have told that they would develop diabetes. They were um, ones that didn't and ones that did were phenotypically identical. It was only these amino acids that tended to differ. The fact that you can predict the development of a condition not one month, not 12 months, but 12 years before it happens is quite striking. The fact that it looks to be a condition that's more associated with uh, amino acids uh, than genetics or anything else is also quite striking. But what the lesson has been learned is that, in fact, leucine, isoleucine are insulin analogs. They are signaling molecules that act on the insulin receptor. They also act on central control um, um, enzymes, particularly mTOR, and have a, a key role in metabolic functions. This is just an illustration of how branched chain amino acids it can be excess nutrients or perhaps metabolic uh, imbalances in the gut microflora. Uh, you can see where branched chain amino acids impact uh, the mTOR protein. Um, but they can also interact with the insulin and insulin receptor um, functions directly or indirectly. Um, and then they can raise diabetes, uh, diabetes or essentially insulin resistance. So if you think of leucine and isoleucine as insulin analogs and there's high levels constantly, eventually the system develops resistance to that. And that's equivalent to insulin resistance. Lots, more than 150 million, 200 million dollars has been spent on looking at GWAS studies for, for diet, type 2 diabetes. We found a few genes that have slightly increased risk. Just these five amino acids, in terms of the relative risk, in terms of their ability to predict, are um, 12 to 20 times better than what the genetic, current genetic tests are. Another amino acid called amino adipic acid, um, which is the sixth amino acid, um, increases that blue bar by another chunk. Um, so these combinations of amino acids, uh, in terms of predicting risk, uh, are, are the best thing that we've found so far uh, in understanding and in predicting uh, diabetes risk. How do you find biomarkers? Um, this goes back to how big should a sample size be. Um, typically, the minimum size, 30 cases, 30 controls, so that's 60. 100 cases, 100 controls, that's better. You want to match in terms of age and gender and general health status. You need to be able to get uh, biological samples from the individuals. Biomarker where it requires a, a muscle biopsy is a terrible biomarker because no one wants to give up chunks of muscle or heart tissue or kidney. So if you can get something like urine or saliva or breath condensate, um, that's better. Generally, you want to make sure you collect things at the same time, same place, the same way. There's lots of faulty biomarker studies where people didn't control for that collection condition. 
to do a validated biomarker study, actually, it has to be quantitative. Uh, there's more than 90% of the biomarker studies that I'm seeing are using non-quantitative methods, and so none of the data can be used. It introduces a curious, you know, guess what I found story, but someone's going to have to repeat exactly the same study again using a quantitative method just to repeat the discovery process. So in that respect, it's, it's almost a total waste to try and do a biomarker study where you're not quantifying the metabolites. Um, once you have discovered the biomarkers, then you actually have to do a validation test. That's a requirement, so it means repeating the whole thing all over again. Different technologies, we've seen this slide before, are suitable for different things. Um, sometimes, just sticking with the known metabolites is safe because those are identifiable, they're knowable, they're quantifiable. Um, but the aminoadipic acid that was found in the study involving um, uh, diabetes required mass spec. And so that was an example where doing some exploratory work allowed them to identify things that were completely surprising. Um, once you've got your list of metabolites measured for your controls and your cases, or the healthy and unhealthy, um, you can use a tool that was developed by Jeff here um, called Rocket um, to actually identify your biomarkers and to identify and calculate what's called the rock curve. And generally, in order to make a useful biomarker, SAT or panel, you want to choose a very small number of genes, proteins, or metabolites. So rock curves, I've mentioned the term receiver operating characteristic curve. And so these are things that are a plot of sensitivity versus specificity. So um, I think this can be sensitivity, this is specificity. Um, they were developed back in World War II when people were trying to measure the accuracy of, of artillery shells and, um, and how good they were at, at hitting tanks and things like that. But the, the idea progressed and moved out into the clinic, um, and it's now used to save lives, I suppose. Um, but it's the way we assess biomarkers. So a perfect uh, log or rock curve should have a, sort of a, an upside down or a, a logarithmic type shape. Uh, a poor rock curve, so that's sort of, this is this log curve. A really bad rock curve should be a, a straight line with a slope of one, which um, basically means a random guess. Um, we can measure the area under the rock curve. This is the area for this one, and this is the area for this one. An area for a perfect rock curve would be one. For a bad rock curve would be one half. And anything else between a half to one is something better than random. So generally, if a rock curve has an AUC area under the curve of 0.75, that's pretty good. Rock curves with an AUC of 1 are, are very rare, but obviously most desirable. So this is an example of the rock curves calculated, different ones with a pretty much a random area under the curve of 0.5, green, 0.6, red, 0.8, and then these are up in the 0.9s, 9.5, and 1. So higher AUC, better biomarker or biomarker set. So what are some examples of, of common biomarkers? Uh, mammograms, um, for distinguishing between benign and malignant tumors. Uh, you might have heard some of this on the news a few months ago. But, but you know they finally did the test and tried to figure out how good mammograms are. So they're very good at identifying masses but they can't distinguish between benign and malignant. And the area under the curve for these things is about 0.53, which is just a little better than flipping a coin. So when you have a fairly expensive, um, somewhat painful and invasive test, uh, and it doesn't tell you a whole lot, the question is why use it? And this is why the recommendations have been probably not to use it. PSA tests, this is something that men over 50 typically have to go through. This is a measure of uh, whether you have prostate cancer. 
um, and it's you know, religiously followed, religiously used, um, it has an AUC of 0.65. So these are probably among the world's most widely used biomarkers. They're also among the worst. And so if this is the standard um, to develop a good set of biomarkers, you don't have to get much better, arguably. Um, so Rocket is a um, page, a web page that was developed to do biomarker identification. And um, uh, like MetaboAnalyst, uh, you start at the top and uh, click on upload your data. There's some example data sets, just like MetaboAnalyst, uh, that allow you to choose something just if you want, but you can use your own data set. Um, there's a data integrity check, not unlike MetaboAnalyst. After you check the data, then you can go to the next to us and start doing some data processing options. And so you can start uh, removing some low quality data, do some missing value estimations, um, do some data transformations if necessary. Uh, we've seen this before where you make sure that things are normally distributed, that's key. Um, and then you can actually start doing the rock curve analysis. So there's three options you can do. Uh, you know, looking at single uh, features, which we call the univariate analysis mode. So you can say, well, I think this metabolite's important. Um, someone told me it's important. Let's see if we can get a rock curve with that. Then they might do it for another one and another one and see what's working. Uh, but the one that most people are more interested in is trying to use a multivariate rock curve. So the whole point of omics is that you want to be able to use not just, you know, glucose to determine whether you've got your diabetic or just one amino acid out of the five to determine whether you might have risk for diabetes. You want to use all five or six. Same things with genes or proteins. So a, a multi-parameter uh, rock curve is what you want to calculate. So this is what one of the options that's done. And there's also another one for doing model evaluation. So in this case, the data that we use, the default data, we just sort of click, 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 did the multivariate one, and here is the model for this particular one. It actually happens to be for a disorder called preeclampsia. And these are using two, three, five, and 10 different biomarkers out of the set of about, I don't know, 200 that it was looking at. So it selected the best uh, metabolites, developed a model. Um, this one, I think, is an SVM model. Um, um, and produced uh, a rock curves. And uh, if you recall, the mammogram and PSA tests are about 0.6. Um, this is 0.95 or better. So a phenomenally good rock curve for actually predicting a disease. In this case, it's a disease called preeclampsia that uh, pregnant women will develop uh, typically around six or seven months into the pregnancy. It's the number one cause of of um, uh, maternal morbidity in the Western world. Um, it uh, places both the baby and the mother at high risk. Uh, and many women die from it. Um, so as I said, it's the number one cause for both morbidity and mortality for pregnancy. Um, the thing is that this is serum data that was collected at three months. They were perfectly healthy at the time. So this is actually a predictive biomarker tells you whether you can get or will get preeclampsia three months later. So that's pretty good for predictive biomarker. Uh, you can go a little further with this tool and identify some of the significant features. So what were the ones that were helping you get this thing? So glycerol, 3-hydroxybutyrate, choline, and acetate are, are really important. So. Those are examples, and so we can run a bunch of tests and examples through Rocket and other software that's been uh, developed. Uh, these are examples taken from the Metabolomics Innovation Center, which is in Edmonton. And we're looking at some examples where we're trying to predict disorders and diagnose difficult to diagnose diseases. So here is the preeclampsia one, um, and this is a rock curve. And the, Green represents sort of the error bars. So this is early preeclampsia. Another one is late preeclampsia, which is developing 
pregnancy at that seven or eight months instead of at six months into the pregnancy. But these are predicting. So they're predicting it at three months into the pregnancy. So take your serum sample. Will you get preeclampsia? So a lot better than PSA and a lot better than the mammogram test. Um, there's also um, uh, trisomy disorders, trisomy 18, trisomy 21, which is Down syndrome. You can identify uh, fetuses that have those disorders, uh, but you have to use amniocentesis generally. So that's invasive, puts the mother at risk and also uh, the baby at risk. Uh, so they'd like to have a non-invasive blood test. And this is just simply using blood. If we used age, particularly for this one, this would go straight up and across. So just combining another common clinical feature with the biological data, uh, you get some very, very good performance. And it's a non-invasive test. Another one is um, congenital heart defects. Again, uh, infants develop this. We can actually do operations in, in utero to repair heart defects now. Uh, but this is one of the number one causes of infant mortality and a uh, huge drain on, on many neonatal care units when heart defects are um, not detected in time. And there's no way to actually identify infants with those, especially in utero. But this is an example where they're taking blood gain, I think, at three months, um, where this sort of metabolite combination allows you to very clearly identify uh, infants at risk or those with heart defects. Cancer cachexia, um, this is um, the muscle wasting and using some of the data that you guys were playing with earlier, um, the, the type or range that you could typically get. Uh, again, this is a spot urine test. The person looks normal to us. We just know they have cancer. Uh, the question is, will they develop this muscle wasting disease that, that comes with about half of all cancers? And this approach seems to be about um, perhaps 80, 90 percent accurate in terms of this area under the curve. Transplant rejection, I uh, showed you some examples. We did the PLSDA, but then you can run it through Rocket. And you can look at both adult kidney uh, transplant rejection and also pediatric kidney transplant rejection. And these all suggest that um, uh, sampling urine um, can tell you very, very quickly whether someone is rejecting the organs um, with high precision. Chronic fatigue syndrome, some people here may know individuals. Um, the um, hard to diagnose disorder, uh, no one knows what's the cause, uh, and again, using a, actually just a combination of two or three metabolites is possible with this to look like identifying it. Mordecai is working on uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, and this is some very preliminary data, um, but it looks like it too is something that can be easily diagnosed um, using urine samples, um, but it's very hard to diagnose using conventional methods. So these are just examples. Um, many other groups doing many other studies are getting similar kinds of results looking at blood and urine. They're looking at both predictive and diagnostic biomarkers. What metabolomics does better than any other omics is that it measures the phenotype or the phenotype that's about to develop or in the process of developing. And it's something I mentioned right at the very beginning. Metabolomics seems to be the best method for doing quantitative phenotyping. Um, the last 10 years, um, we have invested quite a bit into the realm of genome-wide association studies, hoping to find mutations common SNPs um, and variants that might cause a variety of chronic diseases. And, it, and it's been a, a frustrating and actually disappointing process. And because we're looking at so many parameters and having to do so much characterization, um, it's required that we've had to spend a lot of money for each study, analyze tens of thousands of individuals. And to date, um, the rock curve performance for these things are generally in the low 50 percent. Um, some of the metabolomic studies I've shown you and others um, are pretty cheap. Um, the, um, literally $100 in some cases to $200,000. Um, 
didn't really need lots of patients because they're not measuring so many markers. Um, and the number of markers that tend to come out are relatively few, many of them simple. Um, the rock curves are very, very good. Uh, if these tests could be translated to the clinic, they could be substantially cheaper than what other, uh, other kinds of tests would be. So that's biomarker research. Um, pharmaceutical research, again, it's sort of a medical field, but um, it's an issue. It's an issue for all of the fields of um, uh, drug development. Developing a drug takes a long time, costs a lot of money. Um, success rates are very, very low. Uh, it's, uh, it's a major concern in the drug industry. It's a major concern for governments as well. Um, the interesting thing is that metabolomics can be used in just about every phase of, of drug development, from discovery to phase one, two, and three trials, and even so-called phase four FDA approval trials. Um, Genomics and proteomics can also be used and have been used, still are used, but they're typically um, focused in the early phase work. Um, but applications uh, of metabolomics can persist all the way through the drug pipeline, and so that's something that's particularly appealing. These are just sort of indications, more detailed indications of where metabolomics can and has been used in, in drug development for toxicology, looking at biomarkers of, of efficacy. Um, safety biomarkers, clinical safety, clinical efficacy. So they can be used in biomarkers, but they can also be used in, in monitoring and toxicology tests. Um, there's some examples where <coughs> studies in metabolomics, particularly in the realm of cancer, have identified some novel targets. Uh, prostate cancer is a compound called sarcosine uh, in glioma, 2-hydroxyglutarate, uh, and actually a number of cancers seem to have 2-hydroxyglutarate showing up over and over and over again. So this is a study that was done in Metabolon where they actually did a really very well carefully designed study where they looked at biopsies and tissues and distinguished between people with benign hyperplasia and metastatic prostate cancer, and they consistently found very, very large increases in um, in sarcosine, which is a, another amino acid. Um, looked at large numbers of samples, uh, found uh, high elevations in, in metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, it served as a potentially prognostic biomarker. And the fact that it was sarcosine suggested that it would be relevant to a particular enzyme, uh, glycine and methyltransferase. And they found that if they uh, knocked this gene out or knocked it down, they actually attenuated uh, prostate cancer invasion. So this is a case where they found a marker, found an enzyme, found an approach to, to therapeutically treat it, and found results. Um, and then the addition of sarcosine in a knock, uh, or the knockdown of sarcosine dehydrogenase also induced invasive cancer. So that was the converse experiment. So a very, very good study. Um, people have struggled to reproduce it. <laughs> Um, but it might be because they just don't have the facilities or the techniques to, to accurately measure these things. So, uh, again, sort of, uh, there's a technique called genome-wide association study. There's a growing technique called metabolite-wide association studies. Um, as we talked about before, genome-wide studies have been used for a lot of conditions to investigate and identify some target genes. Um, and Although GWAS hasn't been spectacularly successful in finding um, drug targets, it, we have learned a lot. Uh, we've identified a number of important genes that seem to play a, a crucial role, particularly in familial forms of these diseases. Familial Alzheimer's disease, familial Parkinson's, familial cancer. And that gives us, a, I think, a, a, a deep biological understanding. But the concept was originally sold on the idea that doing genome-wide association studies would give us drug targets. And, and so people have used GWAS, they've pulled out druggable genes, they've cloned the targets, they've used very large <laughs> libraries to screen against these targets, and then they go through the iteration of preclinical and clinical trials to eventually produce a market. Um, However, things haven't been that successful. Um, the costs of the GWAS studies, as I say, are millions. Uh, the fraction of success where they actually were able to find genes and actually pull those out that could be druggable is, is somewhat limited. 
finding uh, hits is, is a tough one, and um, the numbers that we know from statistics are about one in five, and take a while. And then there's the one in 500 level once you've gone from the sort of preclinic to the clinical one. And then even the ones that do make it into phase three or beyond, uh, a lot of them are getting pulled. So if you add all the odds up, the time, the dollars, it's, it comes to the same numbers that uh, the drug industry has been talking about. A billion dollars, 10 to 15 years, marginal success rate from the very beginning. But remember, not all diseases are genetic. It's very good evidence that somewhere between 80 to 90 percent of the major uh, conditions, whether it's cancer, heart, heart disease, uh, neurodegenerative diseases actually are probably environmental, diet, or exposure related. Many probably have something to do with the microbiome. Um, the genes that we know about, the ones that have the highest uh, risk factors, like BRCA1, only account for 1 to 2% to of all cases of breast cancer. Heritability for polygenic diseases rarely is above 50%. In most cases, it's somewhere around 20%. Even for ones that we largely consider to be very genetic, like cancer, uh, it's approaching almost 40% now actually seem to be caused by either bacteria, viruses, or other infectious slash um, parasitic organisms. So this is, this is something that we don't appreciate, and, and I, I think perhaps to our, our detriment. So what about metabolites and metabolite-based discoveries? So the idea here is to look to see if we can find metabolites that are associated with disease conditions, just like the ones that I showed you, those rock curves. Um, figure out which metabolites are up and which ones are down, like let's say diabetes, okay, leucine, isoleucine, bigly, those are up. Um, check our pathway chart. Well, some of them aren't so good, but at least we know that isoleucine, leucine, bigly moderate um, uh, insulin secretion. We can look to see if there's anything that knocks down leucine or isoleucine. We could go to Brenda or look at drug bank, some of the ones that affect those enzymes that play a role. And we can also go to our local supplement store or think about some other things. Well, okay, if we've got too much leucine, isoleucine, or valine, why not cut, cut back on that? And Chris Newgard in North Carolina actually did the experiment. And lo and behold, he was able to convert um, pre-diabetic rats into normal rats. So what you can do then is, uh, after you've come up with the therapy, which might be just simply a dietary change or a supplement if you're short, you can start monitoring and say, okay, is the leucine, isoleucine, valine, are they dropping? Is the aminodipic acid levels, are those dropping? Uh, is the TMAO levels for atherosclerosis, are they dropping? Uh, so that's where metabolomics also allows you to start monitoring things. In terms of the metabolomic MetWAS sort of things that we've been doing with uh, biomarkers, about half, actually it's more like three quarters of the studies work. Uh, the data analysis, you guys just did this, you did that today. In order to do your pathway analysis, you can also do it in a day um, to sort of identify potential inhibitors or to decide what your therapy might be. It doesn't take much to say if you're high in isoleucine, leucine, valine, why not cut back? What to do? Well, maybe you don't need a drug, you just have to say eat less of that. Um, and then in terms of success for monitoring, it's not much. So add these things up, and in fact, the route to suggestion for potential therapies is much shorter, much cheaper, much faster. So you might say, okay, you're just sort of exaggerating. Well, let's pretend we had um, dialed back uh, 200 years ago, and we had all these sailors who were coming in dying from a disease called scurvy, and we wanted to figure out what was the cause of the disorder. We send some blood sample into the mass spec and we see there's no ascorbic acid in their serum. Um, they must be short on vitamin C. What should we do? Well, you could say, well, let's come up with a drug that actually produces more vitamin C, or you could just say, let's give them vitamin C. That's what they did. Scurvy's gone. One that's actually more modern, that's probably affected many of you, um, is um, your mothers probably took folate supplements. The reason was is because they made an observation in the 1980s and 90s that low folate led to uh, spina bifida and neural tube defects. That simple supplementation has now profoundly changed uh, the frequency which uh, neural tube de defects are found. Um, and it's also affected a lot of other things related to neural tube defects. <coughs>
80 years ago, uh, anemia, pellagra, and rickets were very common. None of you were alive then, but that, those were the number one concerns of physicians. They were uh, seriously affecting uh, many hundreds of thousands of people. They were affecting the economy. People were dying early. Um, and again, if we had metabolomics then, we could have identified what the problem was and we would have suggested thanks to nutritionists. They did do some of the chemical analysis. They did figure it out. And that's why we have supplemented cereals and foods. Iodine and goiter, that was another one that led to the appearance of iodized salt. Again, metabolomics could have picked that up. PKU, here's one where you can do a, a dietary change. It cures the disease. Epilepsy actually um, can probably be most effectively managed through a ketogenic diet. Uh, again, you typically find very low ketone bodies with people with epilepsy. And there's a, a number of other conditions and disorders where through metabolomics or techniques related to metabolomics, you can identify the markers of the disease and you can make adjustments either through drugs, supplements, or diet changes that have pretty profound effects. More examples, more conditions, more solutions. Um, so this isn't unreasonable. It's not as if it had never been invented or thought of before, but it is something that could be and potentially should be applied. There's also applications in pharma with what's called absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, which is an important part of drug development. And this is really where metabolomics actually first was applied in the drug industry. And it's where you look, give someone a drug, early stages, and look to see what comes out and see what is altered or changed. Um, so we can look at, at urine, we can look at blood. And when we're doing clinical, preclinical trials studies, we do these on rats. The old way of doing it meant that you typically had to raise hundreds of rats, sacrifice them all, do necropsies or autopsies, and do histology. And it was expensive and time consuming. But potentially with metabolomics, uh, you can do this in metabolic cages and see what happens. You can see whether there are trajectories as the rats are being given, whether it's drugs or toxins. And this is what Jeremy Nicholson spent the first 10 years of his metabolomics life doing, which was essentially looking at the responses of, of rats to a variety of different drugs or drug-like compounds. And this is an example of some of their stuff where they were looking at these perturbations and what it did to toxicology. Uh, you can see how some drugs or some poisons affect certain types of, in the kidney, the glomerulus, the cortex, the medulla. Each of these produces certain characteristic metabolites. You don't need to do a dissection or necropsy. You just simply look at what's perturbed, and you can say, ah, that's where it's hitting. And so it could be a different drug or a different toxin, and you can do the same thing. And you can repeat these studies because often the animals recover uh, fairly well, and so you, you don't have to, to sacrifice the rats, and you're just simply collecting urine, and it, it doesn't cost anyone and cause any harm. So you can localize damage, both liver and kidney, and there are certain types of metabolites that are very much associated with these, and this is again the work of, of um, Nicholson's group over many years. Same thing with organ toxicity for the liver, very characteristic features that again are, are tabulated everywhere. So not only in toxicity you can go into phase one and phase two trials where you're looking at people just simply taking the drug, but typically you have to trust that they are taking them. Um, and so you can start looking to see, is the drug there? And, well, here they didn't take it, okay? So if you can record an adverse response for that day, it's not the drug, it's because they didn't take the drug. So this is important for the drug industry, especially if they're trying to worry about safety or efficacy. Same sort of thing happens with compliance. When you take drugs, you're typically told, don't drink, don't take other drugs. Everyone says, I'm not drinking and I'm not taking other drugs. But people lie, and so it is possible to identify when they have taken something they weren't supposed to. So there are other applications. Um, and if we saw ethanol there, this is an application of food analysis. So this is something where, um, what is it, what we eat, and what does it do to our bodies? And we saw the application of fatty food and atherosclerosis. But you can think of what do diets and chronic food consumption do to uh, metabolites in our blood and urine. And this is of great interest to people in nutrition research. 
uh, and in understanding how food is processed in the body. We also want to understand more about the foods that we eat, uh, because there's some good things in them, there's also some bad things in them. So Gatorade is an example of a simple food. You can usually get the ingredients. But if you went to something like beef, they don't have an ingredients list. In fact, there's probably seven or 8,000 metabolites in beef. And getting an exact list is hard. Um, it's probably very similar to the human metabolome, but again, it's important. Obviously, beef and tomatoes, yes, they're both red, but they have from totally different compositions, and they're very important differences. Uh, again, uh, what's in food very much dictates what's in our body and what comes out of our body. Some foods are adulterated, and in fact the application of GCMS, LCMS, NMR uh, has been used to identify adulterated um, juices, um, so you can get cheap juice to taste like expensive juice um, by um, substituting things, and this is done much more widely than we're aware of. But being able to distinguish between different sugars is something you can really only do with metabolomics. Um, beet sugar, corn syrup, there's certain allowed sugars in certain foods um, and very strict regulations. Again, metabolomics allows you to potentially distinguish between those, and that's quite valuable. Dietary biomarkers. Uh, nutrition is all about finding about what we've eaten. Uh, people, as we've seen, tend to, to lie about what they eat, but we also tend to tell what the nutritionists want to hear. You know, did you eat all your vegetables today? Are you eating, uh, you know, seven <coughs> different helpings of, of greens and other fibrous foods? Um, and most everyone will say yes, 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 and then they come back with sort of essentially sometimes very surprising results that um, we're all eating remarkably healthy, but we're all getting sick. And that's because, in fact, um, we don't tell the truth. And we actually all both have relatively poor recall of what we generally eat and how much we eat. So they'd like to be able to go from what are essentially questionnaires or surveys to actually chemically measuring what we're eating. And um, we have this association, we think, with certain types of food, help with either whether you're overweight or underweight, or also how long you live, or propensity for diabetes. And so there are actually markers that metabolomics has identified for a variety of foods, tea, wine, coffee, alcohol, grapefruit. These are all tabulated, various <coughs> studies that people have uh, picked out. Um, and this potentially could allow uh, a substantial change to how nutrition research, which has always been sort of marginalized, going from sort of a, simply a survey uh, science to one that's actually a, a chemically based science. We also are learning, to our surprise, that what we eat substantially influences what grows in our intestines. This is the microbiome. And we can detect those things. We can detect uh, what's in the microbiome. It often shows up in the urine, actually. Um, and that example, as I say, probably from the choline and TMAO for, for cardiovascular disease. Um, but there's also the growing evidence, this was first described seven years ago, but there's many, many studies since where really it doesn't actually have to do with how much you eat, um, but probably uh, whether you were breastfed as an infant or not. Um, but really it's a case of um, the bacteria that grow in, in your, your gut that has a, a very strong issue about whether you will become obese or not. Um, and this abundance of these divisions of uh, bacteroides and firmicutes. Um, and those are defined by, uh, as I say, breast milk, uh, which have very complex carbohydrates, which encourage the growth of certain bacteria, which persist in your body for most of your life. And there's been a, a long time association between people who were breastfed who tend to be lean and those who were formula fed who tend to be obese. And that's been reproduced many times and this association has been seen with the gut microflora. They're also identifying nutritional phenotypes in different countries, so they represent types of foods that people eat, uh, both no matter where they live, uh, but culturally uh, defined. And so this um, is a nutritional phenotype, but it defines very much what's in your microbiome, which is reflected in what's in your urine. They've also looked and monitored uh, how stable the urine metabolome is in individuals, 
over many, many months. And basically, your urine metabolome is as unique as your fingerprint, and it stays with you for most of your life, um, over at least months and perhaps uh, decades. It does change. It changes typically as you go from age w one to two, where you go from uh, milk to solid foods, it changes at puberty, it changes somewhere around age 40, 45, middle age, and it typically also changes again around the 70s or 80s. So what's the head for metabolomics? Um, so some examples of what it does, what it can be used for, applications in mostly human examples, but um, understanding what's in our food also touches in agriculture and environment also in the field of toxicology. Um, obviously, metabolomics tells us a lot about um, um, processes and biological processes and pathways. I haven't talked a lot about that, but to try and survey that for all the systems that everyone talks about, it's just impossible. Um, so what's ahead? Um, one of the most exciting things, I think, is, is chemical imaging. Is there anyone who's ever tried to do metabolic imaging? few people from the Borshies group, um, but um, this is a, a fascinating area and um, I think has a possibility of revolutionizing a lot of what we do, but it's a matter of actually seeing not just stains, which is how we traditionally image things, but to actually look at chemicals. So you can do imaging, you can actually do metabolite imaging through MRI. This has been around for a long time, this is magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, people haven't applied the term metabolomics to it, but it exists, and in fact, it's a very powerful method. You can read out concentrations of metabolites in the brain and the muscle, uh, about a dozen, maybe up to 15 metabolites at a time. And it's macro-scale imaging, but you can also do micro-scale imaging, and this is done now with MALDI, uh, Matrix-Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization. Um, what you do is you um, lay out a sample on a plate and then you spot your raise laser or shine your laser and then make it um, blast away through a, a raster or a grid and you collect uh, data every few microns or tens of microns through that raster grid and each, each spot corresponds to a, a mass spec. The mass spec can be analyzed for ions, can be colored, you can assign the ions to certain compounds and so you can start doing a, a false color image that uh, identifies the concentrations of metabolites. So people are doing microscopic imaging. They're looking at, at features that are a few microns across, uh, thanks to uh, MALDI imaging. Most of the metabolomics I've talked about is metabolomics using you know, mass spec, NMR. These are big instruments. They're expensive. Um, can you do metabolomics in, in handheld devices? There's a thing called the iStat, uh, which was produced, I think, by Abbott Labs. Um, this does, if you want, small-scale metabolomics. Um, so it's bedside metabolism. Volatiles. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about those, but it's certainly an area in gas chromatography excels at. Um, and there's a growing interest in looking at volatiles, and there are also some handheld devices now that are search essentially gas chromatographic instruments. Well, not really gas chromatographic, but they volatile sensors that uh, allow you to pick up things. And they're making use of some really interesting technology, sort of nano or microelectronic systems. So they can produce profiles that allow you to distinguish between certain types of, of uh, volatile compounds. They're not terribly quantitative yet, but um, it's essentially it's headspace chromatography. So metabolomics, uh, and we're wrapping up, and I'm going to have to leave shortly as well, but um, it, it is part of all of the omics. It, it shouldn't be thought of as a loan uh, or as a loner. Um, it, it does play a critical role. Um, there are some things it does very well. There are some things it doesn't do very well. Um, because we understand a lot about metabolism, it certainly opens the door to things like modeling and prediction, what we saw at the very beginning of this particular talk. Because we can use well-understood principles of chemistry and differential equations or stochastic modeling systems. 
Uh, I've shown you examples of how metabolism has been used in lots of areas of medicine, pharmaceutical and clinical chemistry. Um, I think what I'd like to emphasize is the importance of having well-designed experiments. This has been a historic problem in metabolomics. In many cases, people walk up and say, I have some samples that have been in the freezer for the last 20 years. Can you look at them? I don't know anything about them. Hopefully, you find something useful. That's the recipe for a terrible, terrible study. Um, but it's also an issue for us as analytical chemists. Many labs don't spend enough time or attention, and it's not really taught in chemistry labs about quality assurance and quality control. Most of us just do a single experiment in a chemistry lab, but if you're actually being told to analyze hundreds of samples for thousands of analytes, quality assurance and quality control are absolutely essential. And so they're key when people doing in proteomics and genomics and transcriptomics, and so it has to be key if we want to do it in metabolomics. Understanding data analysis principles, statistics, multivariate statistics, uh, these are important. Hopefully you've learned a little bit about it. Hopefully you'll be inspired to learn more. In terms of the trends, um, certainly I think metabolite imaging is, is one of the hotter new trends. And if you have an opportunity to try it or do it, try it. Um, there's a great facility in Victoria that's, that's offering this as a service. Metabolomics is certainly moving to much, much more automation. Um, whether it's analysis, sample loading, sample data crunching, sample prep, all of those things are becoming automated. They need to be. Um, obviously, there's an importance to detect volatiles. It's not done enough. And I think we're finding that there are many volatile compounds that are very important, both for biomarkers and for understanding uh, more about human and mammalian and plant metabolism. How things smell actually has a lot to do with how things taste, and so this is very important uh, in the food industry. Um, so volatiles play a key role there. Quantitate, quantitate, quantitate. If that's the only message I get across, I hope that's uh, one that sticks. Um, quantification is critical. If, if any field in omics is going to be useful to the general public, uh, if it's going to last or persist, Sequencing has been such a success because it is quantitative. Proteomics has struggled, transcriptomics has struggled because they weren't quantitative, largely by choice. Metabolomics, we have that choice, and we come from a long history of analytical quantitative chemistry. We shouldn't ignore it, we should embrace it and use it. Using smaller devices, making things cheaper, we've seen that time and time again. DNA sequencers from a decade ago were the size of refrigerators, now they're much, not much larger than a toaster. Um, UV specs, uh, 80 years ago used to fill a room, now again they're the size of a toaster. Um, it's happening, uh, and it will happen for metabolomics. Many of the devices probably will drift away from the big million dollar FTICRs or NMRs to possibly handheld instruments. And I think as these things get smaller and cheaper and more accessible and easier to use, then we'll start to see them more, more frequently used in doctor's offices or uh, in the field, uh, on the farm. Um, and that, I think, can have a profound uh, change on, on how we do things. So I think the future of metabolomics is bright. Um, I mean, I think that the heyday of genomics, I mean, it's still there, but a lot of the technology has been done. Um, we can't get much faster. Um, the techniques are cool, and it's now a mature technology. Um, we just have to, you know, crunch through these things. Proteomics is sort of, uh, you know, advances in, 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 in mass spectrometry, um, improvements in the technology, the adoption of, of, of quantitative uh, proteomics. I think it's still very much uh, in its prime in terms of technological and computational development. Metabolomics is only about a decade old, and, and you know, who knows where it's going to go. Um, hopefully it'll pick up, hopefully it'll be uh, important, and, and we'll see innovations that same things that revolutionize genomics and proteomics. So uh, it's time for me to wrap up. Um, I want to thank Jeff for all of his help, and Michelle for all of her guidance, and also thank you all for, for listening.